This is Zoe's uh, previous novel, Holding Still for as Long as Possible, which we also have here. Uh, won several awards for LGBT writing. And in this new book, we see Zoe's uncanny ability to write about stuff, well, stuff that happens that too often we either don't discuss or don't want to discuss, but the kind of things that change us in unpredictable ways if they did happen to us. Please join me in welcoming Zoe Whittle. So The Best Kind of People is a novel about aftermath, and it basically um, takes place in a small, wealthy town in New England, and it follows the emotional journey of um, the wife and two kids of a very popular teacher who was arrested at his prep school for a sexual impropriety and attempted sexual assault. Um, but instead of it being, it may sound like a crime novel, um, but it's not. Really, it follows the emotional journeys of uh, Joan, who is his wife, Sadie, his daughter, and Andrew, his son. And so I'm going to read from the prologue, which sets up who the Woodbury family is and, um, and some of their defining moments. And uh, the quote that the book begins with is a quote by Kate Harding. And she says, rape culture's most devilish trick is to make the average non-criminal person identify with the person accused instead of the person reporting the crime. Almost a decade earlier, a man with a 4570 Marlin hunting rifle walked through the front doors of Avalon Hills Prep School. He didn't know that he was about to become a living symbol of the age of white men shooting into crowds. He hadn't slept in four days. He was the kind of angry that only made sense outside of language. He had walked three miles from his new studio apartment above Harry's Cottage Times stage shop, oblivious to the downpour, the thin rip along the seam of his right leather boot, soaked and unaware. He walked ahead without a body, ahead with one single thought, looped and distorted. Students attending all 12 grades were amassed in classrooms, a blur of uniform plaid settling in after first bell. Except for Sadie Woodbury. She was standing in front of an open locker, retrieving her lucky koala bear eraser and straightening her thick brown bangs in the heart-shaped magnetized mirror. The sparkling unicorn sticker at the apex of the heart was beginning to peel away from the plastic glass. It was class speech day in the fifth grade. She had five yellow index cards in her kilt pocket with point form notes in praise of democracy in America. She tongued a mass of orange peach gum to the top of her mouth, flavorless, unwilling to discard it just yet. Her parents didn't allow chewing gum. Amanda had pressed the white paper strip into her palm on the playground before the first morning bell. She saw him behind her in the mirror's reflection. He was a smudge of indecipherable movement. The girl was not part of the plan. He'd drawn a map using a feathered red marker on the back of a pizza box. There was no girl in the diagram. It used to be a ceremonial drug. There was no, it used to be called um, crystal, like a jewel, like all party drugs that had a purpose. It wasn't like they make it seem now on the commercials, like their life is over. They all had jobs and near completed graduate degrees and they went to Burning Man and electronic music festivals and then they went back to work on Monday. He did it once or twice a year with friends, and the point was to dance, 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 large groups of regular people. But friends who had jobs and babies now averted their eyes on the street. Didn't used to be a big deal, except no one else did it anymore, and he had skin like punctured and torn fabric. He stood still, staring at her, the gun hanging from a leather strap around his right shoulder. His grandfather used to hunt with that gun, hounds at their heels. He had a daughter at the school. He'd forgotten about her, too. He didn't think it was possible that a son could be disinherited, disowned as an adult, that he would go too far. He never left this town. He didn't go anywhere. He came to Sunday dinners when he remembered it was Sunday. He was struggling, but every addict is a liar, and when he said that, he wanted to be excused from anything he did or said. He just needed to stop being punished by everyone. 
Sadie closed her locker. The sound startled him. He blinked in a way that meant to wish her away from sight. He was not a killer of children, he knew, despite all evidence to the contrary. Even he had his standards, for fuck's sake. Who have I become? Am I a killer of anyone? These questions broke through the concentrated wall of destructive will, destructive will, and then dissolved. He hadn't thought this through. Hailstones pelted the arched front windows as it dawned on him. The black and white floor tile with messy with splash and the imprint of over 600 children's boots. He noted the weather and its impact on his body. He thought about turning back, but his focus returned. Nothing had been fair since his first black eye. He took the rifle off his shoulder, he cradled it in his arms as though it were a parcel to be delivered. Even this he couldn't do right. What kind of man can't hold a gun? If his dealer hadn't gone to sleep finally, he wouldn't be here. Everyone is against him, especially her. It's always someone else's fault. Have you ever noticed that? Every story you tell, it's always about someone who has done you wrong. But you're the common denominator. She'd said this as she was pulling on a pair of beige cotton tights at the edge of her bed, getting ready for work. Her hands were shaking with rage. Her big toe poked through a hole in the right foot. She had been he had been apologizing, begging her forgiveness for banging on the door in the middle of the night. When she'd let him in, he'd crawled on top of her and she'd had to push him off, but she wasn't as strong and eventually she'd just lay still, clenching her jaw and willing him to die. When will you ever take responsibility for your own life? When will you grow up? He didn't have any money to give her for the morning after pill and she grabbed a roll of 20s from the emergency cookie tin on top of the fridge. It was, bright, it was a bright red tin his mother had filled with Valentine's cupcakes before she had stopped talking to him and after she'd all but adopted his ex, whom she described as having the patience of a saint. You're pathetic, she said. He crumpled in the corner agreeing with her, but then only made it worse. His grip around the rifle tightened. The pad of his index finger, slippery with sweat, touched the trigger. He remembered what a gun was for. But the girl looked at him so much like his own daughter, the one he'd last seen by accident, through a window at the community center where she was practicing gymnastics dance, twirling a long pink and green ribbon through the air. Sadie stared at him for a beat, blowing a half-assed bubble that popped before fully forming. She wasn't certain from this distance what she was seeing, but her heart accelerated involuntarily. It took a few seconds to understand danger. The man lowered the rifle, pointing it at her, and then put it back on his shoulder. She brought him to focus some motion behind him. The man thought, fuck it, I can turn around. I can totally turn around. This doesn't have to be the way it ends for me. I can change. I can change. All at once he was euphoric coming back into his body. Sadie's father, George Woodbury, was a science teacher with a spare that morning. As the man stared at Sadie with a trance-like smile on his face, George yelled a string of astounded gibberish before tackling him. Sadie gripped the eraser and printing half moons in the gummy texture as it gave way to the pressure. A trickle of urine ran down her left leg, soaking her green cotton knee socks. In the midst of their graceless pas de deux grappling, the gun discharged an aimless bullet and it hit the window pane behind them with a crack. A fireworks display of shards rained down on both men, shocking them into momentary submission. The janitor emerged from around the corner and wheeled up his mop to help secure the gunman to the ground. George's chest was heaving, his sweater vest stuck with trunks of glass. It looked as though the man had fallen during a game of limbo. He was pinned, he yowled, rabid, a face in bloom of madness. Sadie stood stationary as chaos began to reign around her. The emergency task force, the volunteer firemen, the organized rows of oblivious children marching past her with their hands on their heads, heading towards the parking lot where they were counted and released to their parents. Her father cradled her in his arms as though she were still a toddler. It's all okay now, Sadie, everything's fine. You're safe, he'd said as she saw a blur go by. His, her chin tucked into his corduroy shoulder. The smell of electric blue dandruff shampoo, ivory soap. She hadn't been lifted up by anyone for years. The story came out later that the gunman who recently was the recently disinherited son of a wealthy business owner. Was, he was the school secretary's boyfriend and he'd come to kill her and then himself. And the front page of the newspaper declared George Woodbury a hero for ambushing him. It was just in instinct, he said. I saw my daughter. I saw the man with the gun. I knew it was better than he'd get me than her and than the other children, so I did what anyone would have done. And most people, when they read that line from the front page of the Avalon Hills Gleaner or the back of the news section in the New York Times, asked themselves, 
Could I have done that? Who am I in this world if not someone who would do just that? After the incident, Sadie spent every hour, every spent an hour every Wednesday with Eleanor Rockbrand, a child psychologist with an office above the stationery store on Peabody Street. She would doodle intricate butterflies in the margins of her feelings journal and talk about the banal details of her day at school. She didn't tell her that she kept the koala bear eraser <coughs> and carried it with her everywhere, that if she didn't, she would be overcome by heart palpitation. And even now, at 16, if she forgot it at home, she would go back to retrieve it. It didn't smell pleasant anymore. The koala's eyes had rubbed into a stoner blur, and she sewed a special pocket for it on the inside lining of her uniform skirt. After that, Mr. Woodbury won Teacher of the Year every year, without exception, until the second incident, the one that split the town in half. No one in the Woodbury family had a particularly memorable face. George could be recognized by his trademark brown tweed jackets with the corduroy elbow pads and his perpetual armload of books and papers. Everybody knew him from school or the many boards and committees he sat on. He was a fixture in the town. He remained the man from Woodbury Lake who'd saved the children. The older people knew him as the son of George Woodbury Sr., at one point the sole general practitioner in town who turned real, turned real estate tycoon and land developer. But even after George's face was splayed bare across page one newsprint for the second time in a decade, it was hard to conjure the precise shape of his nose, the angle of his chin. He was a type of every older white man who could be a politician or a dentist or someone advertising a credit card on television. His wife, Joan Woodbury, under five foot two with the practical haircut of every nurse on the trauma ward. Also blended into the faceless mass of small town life. There were four Woodburys before their son Andrew grew up and moved away. They motored around together in the Volvo through all kinds of weather to track meets and debates, school plays and speech nights. When Joan thought about her family, they appeared in her mind as a foursome around the table every night at six o'clock sharp or driving down Route 32 stopping for ice cream at the lakeside super soft serve. Their faces paled in winter and reddened in summer, and no one stood out as particularly attractive until daughter Sadie was midway, midway through her 16th year and morphed into a striking young woman. There was a practical sort of utility to their bodies, draped in corduroy with sturdy headlines, shirts of strong cotton blends. Say the words wealthy and Protestant and picture a family, and that's them, or close enough. No one saw it coming. That is the prologue from the best kind of people. Um, and I would love to open the open up for questions if you have any questions. Um, and then I can read other segments if you like. Has anyone had a chance to read any of the book? And um, so that really did happen, that kind of thing. 
So, uh, so I did a lot of like, uh, I took a lot of paramedics out for coffee and beer and asked them questions and I was specifically interested in how they endured emotionally. Um, and at the time that I was writing the book and for a number of years after, I was in, I was, uh, in a partnership with a paramedic. And um, so I really got to be involved in like the world and the life of emergency medicine and it's quite, um, I was fascinated because it's very different from me. Uh, I'm a very neurotic, anxious person. I can't, I don't want to be the person in charge if something goes down. And um, I was interested in the type of person who did. And so for the character of Josh, it seemed really natural that he would be drawn to the profession because um, I think that he, you know, he's a risk taker, he's drawn to adrenaline. A lot of paramedics talked about um, wanting to uh, have a different day every day at work, and not just sit in an office. Um, some people want to be, the, Josh in particular wanted to be the, uh, wanted a chance to be the hero. You know, he'd grown up with a lot of trauma in his family, and he wanted to, um, you know, be the good guy, so to speak. And so I saw a lot of that. It was really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you see a lot of hear a lot about burnout, like did they become yes. cynical and jaded? Uh, yes. Were they, still be, were they still able to do their jobs well? Were they leaving the profession? What? Well, it's hard for me to answer that in terms of, I can't remember what's in the book and what's just from my life and my friends, uh, but there's a lot of burnout and there is a real lack of support institutionally. <coughs> Uh, in the emergency medical services. There's a lot of like management, mismanagement and a lot of apathy, um, especially specifically around PTSD and mental health. So um, my partner would have a very dramatic call and then be expected to just get back on the road. And there's, so there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of, um, at least there wasn't at the time, a lot of support when traumatic things happen, ironically. So there's an extreme level of burnout, an extreme level of stress, and a lot of depersonalization where, and a lot of like a dark sense of humor in terms of getting over stuff, but like that really does eat away at people. Yeah. Really, I'm not. I can't remember exactly when I thought of it, but it was um, a ri the original start to the book. Actually, now occurs about a quarter of the way through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as a creative person, uh, how did you overcome creative blocks? That was a good question. Um, I took a really long time to write this book, and I did think that it might uh, fail at a number of times. Um, and so my advice to people about overcoming creative blocks is to really just take breaks when you need it, and um, when you need to take a break, make sure you do things like uh, read a lot, read outside what you normally would read, um, go see plays, see films, try to like refill the empty canister of your brain to try to to focus again on the project at hand. Um, because I now work in TV, I sometimes find that that does help with the blog because now that when I have time to write fiction, I will really focus. And I also um, advise people to really treat it like a job and set aside like as though you have shifts at your desk, you know, to, and to sit and make yourself do it and turn off the internet and that sort of thing. The best kind of people came from, I actually related to your last question, I was having a, a day of writer's block with the other novel, and I turned on CBC radio, and I heard um, a program on The Current about, it was right around the time, the time of the Russell Williams case, and there was a lot of discussion around how could his wife not have known. And, and so the stigma that she was facing was very interesting to me. And there was a therapist the related story is that there was a therapist in Ottawa who works with women who decide to stay with men who are in jail or are accused of sex crimes. And I was um, fascinated by those women. Uh, I felt a lot of judgment towards them. And I set aside a creative exercise for myself to try to have empathy for her or for somebody who would be in that group. Um, and for me, a lot of novel writing is about empathy and the empathy you have to have for all of your characters, even the ones who are very profoundly unlikable. 
And uh, so I tried, that's how I came up with Joan and started to develop her as a person, giving her this circumstance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, well, that's actually uh, an interesting point about uh, empathy. So you've got three characters who are reacting to what the fourth character may or may not have done. And, I mean, obviously, it, it's fiction. But did you find as you were writing that you emphasized, uh, empathized or identified with Sadie or Joan or Andrew in particular, or were they just sort of, um, because they're, they're very distinct personalities and yet they're kind of all in this together, kind of, so I'm just curious as to what you found one that really spoke to I found Sadie easier to write, um, because I have been a teenage girl and so I understand that a little bit better, even though it's been a long time now. Um, Joan's circumstance is very different from mine. So she was hard to get. I found the first few drafts of Joan to be very wooden, and then something broke, and I was able to really understand her. Um, Andrew, I understood his background, but it was difficult sometimes to feel good about Andrew because he, um, because of the position he takes. I won't spoil it, but <coughs> so I had things that I could relate to and things like ways I could get in, that, so that even if they were behaving um, in ways that I didn't. That I, in ways I wouldn't have, I was able to like relate to their emotional story. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, this might be really vague, but um, when you come up with an idea for a novel, how do you start writing with, you obviously don't start writing with the first line of the book, but how do you start? Um, it depends on the project. I often will start just free writing, which is um, a really good way to get out of your critical brain. So just like put pen to paper or start typing and try to um, eliminate the editorial voice in your head. There's a book called Writing Down the Bones, which I found very helpful, where she talks a lot about the importance of free writing. And so usually when I do three or four pages of stuff that's probably 90% garbage, there'll be one sentence that's really great that I'll pull out and then expand on. Um, but sometimes I do start with an idea, and I'll mull it around for a while, and then um, try to write it out. So for Holding Still, I started with an outline of plot development. And then by the end of the book, it was completely thrown out. But it, that, that structure was something that really helped me start um, and with Bottle Rocket Hearts, my first book, I it was all char inter interior ca ca character monologue. And um, that came easy just in terms of a voice. I was able to run with that voice. And it was harder to put the plot onto the voice. So it cut the, each book has been different. Yeah. Um, so you with your characters your So funny, I remember... When Bottle Rocket Hearts came out, my first book, I felt almost like I was grieving them. Like they had lived in my head for years, and then I wasn't hanging out with them anymore. And it was weird and awkward, and I found that I missed them. Um, so, and so sometimes that makes me feel like I want to write sequels, or I want to write other things with those people. Um, and I won't spoil the ending, but there is like, a way that I try to think about the best kind of the way the people from the best kind of people and how they, um, what they do in the next few years. And uh, right now I'm talking to a few different people about trying to make it into a TV show or a movie, and that's a fun way to keep them around and keep them alive. Any other questions? Yeah. How does it work writing for TV? I would say that writing for TV has helped me zero in on action because with TV writing you you have to get into a scene as late as possible and leave as early as possible and um, sort of the opposite of how one usually approaches prose. Um, but I feel like there's been a lot of the criticism for my first two novels were about. Them, they were very like emotional journeys, character based, not a lot of plot, um, and so it really helped me figure out how to work with plot or acknowledge it and 
allow it to come through differently. But I don't actually don't think that TV, I mean, other than writing fiction got my foot in the door in the industry, but I've had to unlearn a lot of things about writing fiction in order to write well for TV. Like a lot of my first outlines and scripts were like, showrunners would get them and be like, there's too many words. <laughs> Say it quicker and not as flowery, you know? I'll just pick at random and then change them later. So Sadie, I changed Sadie's name this year, but for five years she was Liz. Um, and I like Sadie better. But sometimes they just stick, like Andrew and Joan. I just felt like they were a little bit generic names, and they ended up just, I couldn't change them at the end. Um, but I think I'm gonna, going to become more thoughtful about it, because I've noticed lately when I'm reading novels that have particularly well-named characters, I feel very attached to them easier, so, yeah. So, as a, the question is, uh, as a creative writer, how did I go from, like, passion to profession? It's, a, it's an ongoing journey. I would say that um, it's writing is created, especially poetry and fiction, are things that I have just always felt very committed to. And so I've always had to have second careers or jobs to support my writing career up until recently. And so um, I would often recommend um, if you know that you are really focused and passionate on doing a certain type of writing, especially if it's the kind of writing that doesn't really make you a good living, to have a, a very solid job that will still allow you for the energy to write when you have the time. Yeah. There are a number of years that I wrote, I got up early in the morning and wrote a few hours before work, that sort of thing, and then some years you can luck out and get grants or you know, but it's always a juggle, and, and um, it is, I think, probably the biggest struggle for most writers. So, you've written a lot of fiction, and you've written a changed a lot. Uh, the first draft, I felt like I wrote the first draft in a very kind of black and white way where Joan felt one way, Sadie felt the other way, they fought about it. It was very, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't complicated enough, there wasn't enough emotional nuance or story nuance, but I had to write that version in order to get to the next level. Um, and so it was something that I was exploring as I wrote, and I didn't, um, I'm hoping that the, the draft still had a lot of questions to it, because um, there certainly are no hard and fast answers. Yes? Can you talk about your reading life and what you love to read? Sure, yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, let's see, I love to read poetry, and I love to read um, experimental novels, novels that play with porn. Um, and are you looking for books I've read recently that are? I guess so, yeah. Just, yeah. I'm curious about how your reading informs your writing. And I know you write book reviews too, and how that did, yeah. perhaps informs or haunts your writing as well. Uh, I have stopped writing book reviews, but I did it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually enjoy reading a lot better now that I'm not being uh, doing the critic on the side business. Um, and what I read does absolutely inform what I'm writing. For example, I had a lot of trouble figuring out um, how to embody their voices, especially because I hadn't really worked with in realism. I hadn't done straight up 
third-person omniscience before. So I read a number of David, David Bergen novels. He's like a, a master of that. And um, <coughs> Alice Smith's novel, or is it A.M. Holmes? How is it that? The Accidental is like a, it's like a master class on how to write third-person, so I reread that. Um, I read a, a, a lot of Sadie Smith, um, just sort of to try to get the balance. Because normally, I think my natural way of writing is to write in first person and is to um, meander around and not be as sharp. Uh, and, and I enjoy that, but I was trying, trying to just try on something new this time. Um, and recently, last week, I read a novel, The Girls by Emma Klein. It was phenomenal. So um, I, I, read, I read widely, but. Um, Lately, I've been reading a lot of uh, yeah, realism based novels. <coughs> yeah. uh, when it comes to creative ideas, what is uh, your best advice for anybody out there? For creative ideas? Yes. Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, the question was, what are, what's my advice for um, uh, creative people for coming up with ideas? I think. Um, <coughs> I think it's funny, like some advice that we, I, I took, I've learned how to write stand-up comedy in the last few years, and one of the pieces of advice that I learned from my teacher was to notice when people laugh, and then write it down, and then try to develop your material from that sort of organically. And so I think um, noticing when an idea strikes, when you have a question, an unanswerable question, when you are um, overhearing dialogue, when you're in public, and you're, you want to keep listening, um, when you see someone, I used to play a game when I was a teenager where we'd sit in the park and watch people and then create their backstory and who they are. Like that kind of, like trying to step into other people's heads. Um, and then also I think a lot of people's first novels or first collections of poetry or short stories, they're a lot about, um, you know, the, the, those core obsessions that you have as a person. Everybody has a core obsession. Um, and so sometimes I joke that, you know, no matter what novel I write, I could write a about unicorns on Mars, and uh, what I would still be writing about is anxiety, because I'm obsessed with anxiety and how it plays out in different ways. So all of my books have that in there somewhere. So trying to figure out like what you really want to wrestle with, um, and uh, that thing that makes you really excited to explore it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you had to choose a Canadian setting for the best kind of thing, which city or town would you have chosen? That's a good question. I think I probably would have set it in the eastern townships of Quebec. That's where I was born. And um, so that's where I'm most familiar with small town life. Um, although, my brother recently moved to the Okanagan and I find it really fascinating out there too. So maybe it's more near there. But, uh, it's harder to find like the rural wealth enclaves in Canada, um, so it would have been a, would have been different for sure. Hmm. Any other questions? I thought I saw him. I'm hearing that. No. Do you find it difficult? to ensure that the, the work of other authors, the, your ideas, don't kind of creep into your, into your work? Like, you know, the way that they describe something, or maybe an idea that you had, you know, at, for your leisure, you know, a few years ago. Is it easy to come with a clean slate with just your own ideas? Or is it something you have to kind of fight off? It's a good question. The other day I came across a notebook. Did everyone hear the questions? I came across a notebook and then there's like three lines and then a quote from Susan Sontag at the bottom. And then I couldn't, I didn't know that if I, had I written it without quotes, was someone talking and I wrote it down or was it my own voice? I couldn't, it's been too long, I, I don't really know. Um, and it's hard to know where the lines are in terms of like where you get your inspiration and how much you're reading. Some writers don't, when they're writing a novel, 
set at a certain time. They won't read any novels set at that time, that time, or they won't read any novels at all when they're writing a novel. They'll read only nonfiction. I need to be able to. I need to be reading in my genre while I'm writing it, um, and that does make me afraid sometimes that I will have accidentally borrowed an idea or a phrase or something. Um, but I think. Mostly, once you've written something like 20 times, as you have to do when you write a novel, it becomes your own work, uh, even if you have, even if it's something sparked your interest in a certain way. Um, that answer? Canadian culture? Yeah. How does this talk connect to Canadian culture? Um, well, I think it's uh, loosely, you know, the, every Canadian novel that comes out is part of Canadian culture. Um, this book specifically set in the States does not, you know, contribute to that kind of conversation, but I think, you know, all books come from other books. I can't remember who I'm quoting when I say that, but I find it very useful. Think about and uh, and I think that it's hopefully what what one hopes is that it becomes part of um, part of a cultural conversation that's going on at the moment. So that's that's my hope for the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's next for you? Hey, um, I am working on a sort of a hybrid text that's poetic prose and memoir together. Um, it's going very sloppily, but I'm very obsessed with it. Uh, so I think that'll be like a short novella length piece. And then I also have another novel that I was working on before this one. Um, and I don't really have a good pitch line for it yet, but it's set uh, in the 20s in Turkey and then in the 90s and um, uh, following a musician in, this, uh, in Canada and the States. So it's sort of about um, her and her grandmother's life and how they intersect. Hopefully. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? So, um, without just one name, you can help me not getting into the title of the country. I'm curious, who might you consider to be some of the best friends? Who, okay. Without giving away the plot of the book, who, I'm, I'm being asked who. I'd like to consider. Huh. It's so funny, for the longest time, this book was called The Worst Kind of People. <laughs> and it was, uh, and Douglas Copeland came out with the book Worst Person Ever, and I was mad because I felt like it was too similar. And then my editor suggested twisting it into the positive. Um, who do I consider the best kind of people? Um, it's a really big question. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of people I have tremendous respect for. I often uh, think about the jobs that that I couldn't do and that I don't feel like I have enough to give in terms of like nursing, teaching, helping professions, that sort of thing. Um, and I have a lot of respect for people who, uh, for activists and for people who make social change. Um, so I think those are the best kinds. And you know, the arts, also artists that are able to. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, sorry, Brooke. Okay. Yes. Um, how does uh, a book get onto the long list of uh, the door prize and the short list? Is are you, do you know, or are you able to tell in a nutshell what the process is? Uh, the process is that all publishers will submit uh, a couple of books per season or per year. Um, I think they have a limited amount, I think between two and three each. Um, and then the jury reads about, I think this year they read 165, and they select 12 for the long list. And then from the long list, they select four or five. Um, apparently, they don't choose the winner until the day before the ceremony. Um, but I'm kind of still learning this as I go along, so um, 
all of this. The shortlist will be announced on Monday. And we'll know. How do you feel about the attention of being on the long list? I think it's different, I would imagine. It's very different. Um, I'm very thrilled about it. I feel very lucky. Uh, I have been on juries, not, I mean, I've been on Arts Council juries and um, writing prize juries, and it's really given me insight into the fact that um, what gets selected, it's really not whether or not your work is good or not, it's really about the taste of the people in the room at the time, and so there's a ton of luck involved. I used to cry every time I got a rejection letter, and now I'm like, part of the deal, part of writing life, and I know that it's a little bit arbitrary. Um, but I honestly never thought I would write a book that would fit into the scope of what Gillard books usually are. And I'm just thrilled that it did. And that's su surprising, quite honestly, because the book almost failed so many times and I well, didn't have that much confidence about it when, when it was getting ready to come up. So, I'm pretty psyched. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you. <laughs>
face of the you know, that it's part of, you know, these aren't part of humanity because it's happened and that we make terrible choices. So, you know, that's the kind of thing I wanted to look at in terms of, uh, like, especially in the prologue when they're like, how do we know what we would do in this moment? Like, would you have been able to tackle the gun and all that? Those big questions about who you think you are versus who um, you actually are. And I'm interested in that, how it changes as we get older in terms of our idealism and um, sort of thing. But even the gun, you'd have to say, but oh, wait a minute, it could all be completely different. Yeah. And then it gets, yeah. <coughs> <coughs>